Section 19 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Nightingale. In China, as you know, the emperor is a Chinaman, and all the people around him are Chinamen too. It is many years since the story I am going to tell you happened, but that is all the more reason for telling it, lest it should be forgotten. The emperor's palace was the most beautiful thing in the world. It was made entirely of the finest porcelain, very costly, but at the same time so fragile that it could only be touched with the very greatest care. There were the most extraordinary flowers to be seen in the garden. The most beautiful ones had little silver bells tied to them, which tinkled perpetually, so that one should not pass the flowers without looking at them. Every little detail in the garden had been most carefully thought out, and it was so big that even the gardener himself did not know where it ended. If one went on walking, one came to beautiful woods with lofty trees and deep lakes the wood extended to the sea which was deep and blue deep enough for large ships to sail right up under the branches of the trees among these trees lived a nightingale which sang so deliciously that even the poor fisherman who had plenty of other things to do lay still to listen to it when he was out at night drawing in his nets heavens how beautiful it is he said but then he had to attend to his business and forgot it the next night, when he heard it again, he would again exclaim, Heavens, how beautiful it is! Travelers came to the emperor's capital from every country in the world. They admired everything very much, especially the palace and the gardens. But when they heard the nightingale, they all said, This is better than anything. When they got home, they described it, and the learned ones wrote many books about the town, the palace, and the garden, but nobody forgot the nightingale. It was always put above everything else. Those among them who were poets wrote the most beautiful poems, all about the nightingale in the woods by the deep blue sea. These books went all over the world, and in course of time some of them reached the emperor. He sat in his golden chair, reading and reading, and nodding his head, well pleased to hear such beautiful descriptions of the town, the palace, and the garden but the nightingale is the best of all he read what is this said the emperor the nightingale why i know nothing about it is there such a bird in my kingdom and in my own garden into the bargain and i've never heard of it imagine my having to discover this from a book then he called his gentleman in waiting who was so grand that when any one of a lower rank dared to speak to him or ask him a question he only would answer, P, which means nothing at all. There is said to be a very wonderful bird called a nightingale here, said the emperor. They say that it is better than anything else in all my great kingdom. Why have I never been told anything about it? I've never heard it mentioned, said the gentleman in waiting. It has never been presented at court i wish it to appear here this evening to sing to me said the emperor the whole world knows what i am possessed of and i know nothing about it i have never heard it mentioned before said the gentleman in waiting i will seek it i will find it but where was it to be found the gentleman in waiting ran upstairs and downstairs and in and out of all the rooms and corridors no one of all those he met had ever heard anything about the nightingale so the gentleman-in-waiting ran back to the emperor and said that it must be a myth invented by the writers of the books your imperial majesty must not believe everything that is written books are often mere inventions even if they do not belong to what we call the black art but the book in which i read it is sent to me by the powerful emperor of japan so it can't be untrue i will hear this nightingale i insist upon it being here to-night i extend my most gracious protection to it and if it is not forthcoming 
I will have the whole court trampled upon after supper. Tsing Pa, said the gentleman in waiting, and away he ran again, up and down all the stairs, in and out of all the rooms and corridors. Half the court ran with him, for they, none of them, wished to be trampled on. There was much questioning about this nightingale, which was known to all the outside world, but to no one at court. At last they found a poor little maid in the kitchen. She said, Oh, heavens, the nightingale! I know it very well. Yes, indeed, it can sing. Every evening I'm allowed to take broken meat to my poor sick mother. She lives down by the shore. On my way back, when I'm tired, I rest a while in the wood, and then I hear the nightingale. Its song brings the tears into my eyes. I feel as if my mother were kissing me. Little kitchen maid, said the gentleman in waiting, I will procure you a permanent position in the kitchen and permission to see the emperor dining, if you will take us to the nightingale. It is commanded to appear at court tonight. Then they all went out into the wood where the nightingale usually sang. Half the court was there. As they were going along at their best pace, a cow began to bellow. Oh, said a young courtier, there we have it. What wonderful power for such a little creature. I have certainly heard it before. No, those are the cows bellowing. We are a long way yet from the place. Then the frogs began to croak in the marsh. Beautiful, said the Chinese chaplain. It is just like the tinkling of the church bells. No, those are the frogs, said the kitchen maid. But I think we shall soon hear it now. Then the nightingale began to sing. There it is, said the little girl. Listen, listen, there it sits. And she pointed to a little gray bird up among the branches. Is it possible, said the gentleman in waiting, I should never have thought it was like that. How common it looks, seeing so many grand people must have frightened all its colors away. "'Little Nightingale,' called the kitchen maid quite loud, "'our gracious emperor wishes you to sing to him.' "'With the greatest pleasure,' said the nightingale, "'warbling away in the most delightful fashion. "'It is just like crystal bells,' said the gentleman in waiting. "'Look at its little throat, how active it is. "'It's extraordinary that we have never heard it before. "'I'm sure it will be a great success at court.' "'Shall I sing again to the emperor?' said the nightingale, who thought he was present. "'My precious little nightingale,' said the gentleman-in-waiting, "'I have the honor to command your attendance at court festival tonight, "'where you will charm his gracious majesty, the emperor, with your fascinating singing.' "'It sounds best among the trees,' said the nightingale, "'but it went with them willingly when it heard that the emperor wished it. The palace had been brightened up for the occasion. The walls and the floors, which were all of china, shone by the light of many thousand golden lamps. The most beautiful flowers, all of the tinkling kind, were arranged in the corridors. There was hurrying to and fro, and a great draught, but this was just what made the bells ring. One's ears were full of the tinkling. In the middle of the large reception room where the emperor sat, a golden rod had been fixed, on which the nightingale was to perch. The whole court was assembled, and the little kitchen maid had been permitted to stand behind the door, as she now had the actual title of cook. They were all dressed in their best. Everybody's eyes were turned towards the little gray bird at which the emperor was nodding. The nightingale sang delightfully, and the tears came into the emperor's eyes. Nay, they rolled down his cheeks— and then the nightingale sang more beautifully than ever. Its notes touched all hearts. The emperor was charmed, and said the nightingale should have his gold slipper to wear around its neck. But the nightingale declined with thanks. It had already been sufficiently rewarded. I have seen the tears in the eyes of the emperor. That is my richest reward, and tears of an emperor have a wonderful power. God knows I'm sufficiently recompensed. And then it burst into its sweet heavenly song. 
that is the most delightful coquetting i have ever seen said the ladies and they took some water into their mouths to try to make the same gurgling when any one spoke to them thinking so to equal the nightingale even the lackeys and the chambermaids announced that they were satisfied and that is saying a great deal they are always the most difficult people to please yes indeed the nightingale had made a sensation it was to stay at court now and to have its own cage as well as liberty to walk out twice a day and once in the night it always had twelve footmen with each one holding a ribbon which was tied around its leg there was not much pleasure in an outing of that sort the whole town talked about the marvelous bird and if two people met one said to the other night and the other answered gale and then they sighed perfectly understanding each other eleven cheesemongers children were called after it but they had not got a voice among them one day a large parcel came for the emperor outside was written the word nightingale here we have another new book about this celebrated bird said the emperor but it was no book it was a little work of art in a box an artificial nightingale exactly like the living one but it was studded all over with diamonds rubies and sapphires when the bird was wound up it could sing one of the songs the real one sang and it wagged its tail which glittered with silver and gold a ribbon was tied around its neck on which was written the emperor of japan's nightingale is very poor compared to the emperor of china's everybody said oh how beautiful and the person who brought the artificial bird immediately received the title of imperial nightingale carrier in chief now they must sing together what a duet that will be then they had to sing together but they did not get on very well for the real nightingale sang in its own way and the artificial one could only sing waltzes there's no fault in that said the music master it's perfectly in time and correct in every way then the artificial bird had to sing alone it was just as great a success as the real one and then it was so much prettier to look at it glittered like bracelets and breastpins it sang the same tune three and thirty times over and yet it was not tired people would willingly have heard it from the beginning again but the emperor said that the real one must have a turn now but where was it no one had noticed that it had flown out of the open window back to its own green woods but what is the meaning of this said the emperor all the courtiers railed at it and said it was a most ungrateful bird we have got the best bird though said they and the artificial bird had to sing again and this was the thirty-fourth time that they heard the same tune but they did not know it thoroughly even yet because it was so difficult the music master praised the bird tremendously and insisted that it was much better than the real nightingale not only as regarded the outside with all the diamonds but the inside too because you see my ladies and gentlemen and the emperor before all in the real nightingale you never know what you will hear but in the artificial one everything is decided beforehand so it is and so it must remain it can't be otherwise you can account for things you can open it and show the human ingenuity in arranging the waltzes how they go and how one note follows upon another those are exactly my opinions they all said and the music master got leave to show the bird to the public next sunday they were also to hear it sing said the emperor so they heard it and all became as enthusiastic over it as if they had drunk themselves merry on tea because that is a thoroughly chinese habit then they all said oh and stuck their forefingers in the air and nodded their heads but the poor fisherman who had heard the real nightingale said it sounds very nice and it's very like the real one but there's something wanting we don't know what the real nightingale was banished from the kingdom the artificial bird had its place on a silken cushion close to the emperor's bed all the presents it had received of gold and precious jewels were scattered around it its title had risen to be 
chief imperial singer of the bedchamber in rank number one on the left side for the emperor reckoned that side the important one where the heart was seated and even an emperor's heart is on the left side the music master wrote five and twenty volumes about the artificial bird the treatise was very long and written in all the most difficult chinese characters everybody said they had read and understood it for otherwise they would have been reckoned stupid and then their bodies would have been trampled upon things went on in this way for a whole year the emperor the court and all the other chinamen knew every little gurgle in the song of the artificial bird by heart but they liked it all the better for this and they could all join in the song themselves even the street boys sang zee 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 and cluck 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 and the emperor sang it too but one evening when the bird was singing its best and the emperor was lying in bed listening to it something gave way inside the bird with a whizz then a spring burst whirr and all the wheels and the music stopped the emperor jumped out of bed and sent for his private physicians but what good could they do then they sent for the watchmaker and after a good deal of talk and examination he got the works to go again somehow but he said it would have to be saved as much as possible because it was so worn out and he could not renew the works so as to be sure of the tune this was a great blow they had only dared to let the artificial bird sing once a year and hardly that but then the music master made a little speech using all the most difficult words he said it was just as good as ever and his saying it made it so five years now passed and then a great grief came upon the nation for they were all very fond of their emperor and he was ill and could not live it was said a new emperor was already chosen and people stood about in the street and asked the gentleman in waiting how their emperor was going on p answered he shaking his head the emperor lay pale and cold in his gorgeous bed the courtiers thought he was dead and they all went off to pay their respects to their new emperor the lackeys ran off to talk matters over and the chambermaids gave a great coffee party cloth had been laid down in all the rooms and corridors so as to deaden the sound of footsteps so it was very very quiet but the emperor was not dead yet he lay stiff and pale in the gorgeous bed with its velvet hangings and heavy golden tassels there was an open window high above him and the moon streamed in upon the emperor and the artificial bird beside him the poor emperor could hardly breathe he seemed to have a weight on his chest he opened his eyes and then he saw that it was death sitting upon his chest wearing his golden crown in one hand he held the emperor's golden sword in the other his imperial banner round about from among the folds of the velvet hangings peered many curious faces some were hideous others gentle and pleasant they were all the emperor's good and bad deeds which now looked him in the face when death was weighing him down do you remember that whispered one after the other do you remember this and they told him so many things that the perspiration poured down his face i never knew that said the emperor music music sound the great chinese drums he cried that i may not hear what they are saying but they went on and on and death sat nodding his head just like a chinaman at everything that was said music music shrieked the emperor you precious little golden bird sing sing i have loaded you with precious stones and even hung my own golden slipper around your neck sing i tell you sing but the bird stood silent there was nobody to wind it up so of course it could not go death continued to fix the great empty sockets of its eyes upon him and all was silent so terribly silent suddenly close to the window there was a burst of lovely song it was the living nightingale perched on a branch outside 
it had heard of the emperor's need and had come to bring comfort and hope to him as it sang the faces round became fainter and fainter and the blood coursed with fresh vigor in the emperor's veins and through his feeble limbs even death himself listened to the song and said go on little nightingale go on yes if you give me the gorgeous golden sword yes if you give me the imperial banner yes if you give me the emperor's crown and death gave back each of these treasures for a song and the nightingale went on singing it sang about the quiet churchyard where the roses bloom where the elder flowers scents the air and where the fresh grass is ever moistened anew by the tears of the mourner this song brought to death a longing for his own garden and like a cold gray mist he passed out of the window thanks thanks said the emperor you heavenly little bird i know you i banished you from my kingdom and yet you have charmed the evil visions away from my bed by your song and even death away from my heart how can i ever repay you you have rewarded me said the nightingale i brought the tears to your eyes the very first time i ever sang to you and i shall never forget it those are the jewels which gladden the heart of a singer but sleep now and wake up fresh and strong i'll sing to you then it sang again and the emperor fell into a sweet refreshing sleep the sun shone in at his window when he woke refreshed and well none of his attendants had yet come back to him for they thought he was dead but the nightingale still sat there singing you must always stay with me said the emperor you shall only sing when you like and i will break the artificial bird into a thousand pieces don't do that said the nightingale it did all the good it could keep it as you have always done i can't build my nest and live in this palace but let me come whenever i like then i will sit on the branch in the evening and sing to you i will sing to cheer you and to make you thoughtful too i will sing to you of the happy ones and of those that suffer too i will sing about the good and the evil which are kept hidden from you the little singing bird flies far and wide to the poor fisherman and the peasant's home to numbers who are far from you and your court i love your heart more than your crown and yet there is an odor of sanctity around the crown too i will come and i will sing to you but you must promise me one thing everything said the emperor who stood there in his imperial robes which he had just put on and he held the sword heavy with gold upon his heart one thing i ask you tell no one that you have a little bird who tells you everything it'll be better so then the nightingale flew away the attendants came in to see after their dead emperor and there he stood, bidding them good morning. End of section 19。section 20 of fairy tales from Hans Christian Andersen。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit LibriVox.org。Recording by Amelia Chesley. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Storks. A stork had built his nest on the roof of the last house in a little town. The mother stork was sitting on the nest with her little ones, who stuck out their little black beaks, which had not turned red yet. The father stork stood a little way off the ridge of the roof, erect and stiff, with one leg drawn up under him so as at least to be at some trouble while standing sentry. One might have thought he was carved out of wood, he stood so still. It will look so grand for my wife to have a sentry on guard by the nest, he thought. People won't know that I am her husband. I dare say they think I have orders to stand there. It looks smart. And so he remained standing on one leg. A party of children were playing in the street, and when they saw the stork, one of the boldest boys, followed by the others, sang the old song about the storks, but he sang it just as it came into his head. 
Oh, Father Stork, Father Stork, fly to your nest. Three featherless fledglings await your return. The first of your chicks shall be stuck through the breast, the second shall hang, and the third shall burn. Hark, what are the boys singing, said the little storks. They say we are to be hanged and burnt. Don't bother your heads about them, said the mother stork. Don't listen to them, and then it won't do you any harm. But the boys went on singing and pointing their fingers at the storks. Only one boy, whose name was Peter, said that it was a shame to make fun of the creatures, and he would not take part of it. The mother bird comforted her little one, saying, Do not trouble yourselves about it. Look at your father, how quietly he stands, and on one leg, too. But we are so frightened, said the young ones, burying their heads in their nest. The next day, when the children came back to play, and they saw the storks, they began their old song. The first of your chicks shall be stuck through the breast, the second shall hang, and the third shall burn. Are we to be hanged and burnt? asked the little storks. No, certainly not, said the mother. You are to learn to fly. See if I don't drill you. Then we will go into the fields and visit the frogs. They curtsy in the water to us and sing, Cox, cox, and then we gobble them up. That's a treat, if you like. And what next? asked the young ones. Oh, then all the storks in the country assemble for the autumn maneuvers, and you will have to fly your best, for the one who cannot fly will be run through the body by the general's beak, so you must take good care to learn something when the drills begin. After all, then, we may be staked, just as the boys said, and listen, they are singing it again now. Listen to me and not to them, said the mother stork. After the grand maneuvers, we shall fly away to the warm countries, ever such a way off, over the woods and mountains. We go to Egypt, where they have three-cornered houses, the points of which reach above the clouds. They are called pyramids, and they are older than any stork can imagine. Then there is a river which overflows its banks, and all the land round turns to mud. You walk about in mud, devouring frogs. Oh, said all the young ones. Yes, it is splendid. You do nothing but eat all day. While we are so well off there, there is not a leaf on the trees in this country, and it is so cold that the clouds freeze all to pieces and fall down in little bits. She meant snow, but did not know how to describe it any better. Do the naughty boys freeze to pieces? asked the young storks. No, they don't freeze to pieces, but they come very near to it and have to sit moping in dark rooms. You, on the other hand, fly about in strange countries, in the warm sunshine among flowers. Some time passed, and the little ones were big enough to stand up in the nest and look about them. The father stork flew backwards and forwards every day, with nice frogs and little snakes and every kind of delicacy he could find. It was so funny to see the tricks he did to amuse them. He would turn his head right around onto his tail, and he would clatter with his beak as if it was a rattle. And then he told them all the stories he heard in the swamps. Well, now you must learn to fly, said the mother stork one day, and all the young ones had to stand on the ridge of the roof. Oh, how they wobbled about trying to keep their balance with their wings, and how nearly they fell down. Now look at me, said the mother. This is how you must hold your heads, and move your legs so. One, two, one, two, and this will all help you to get on in the world. Then she flew a little way, and the young ones made a clumsy little hop, and down they came with a bump, for their bodies were too heavy. I don't want to fly, said one of the young ones, creeping down into the nest again. I don't care about going to the warm countries. Do you want to freeze to death here when the winter comes? Shall the boys come along and hang or burn or stake you? I will soon call them. No, no, said the young one, hopping up onto the roof again, just like the others. By the third day, they could all fly fairly well. Then they thought they could hover in the air, too, and they tried it, but flop! They soon found they had to move their wings again. Then the boys began their song again. Oh, Father Stork, Father Stork, fly to your nest. Shall we fly down and pick their eyes out? asked the young ones. No, leave them alone, said their mother. Only pay attention to me. That is much more important. One, two, three. Now we fly to the right. One, two, three. Now to the left. And round the chimney. That was good. That last stroke of the wings was so pretty. 
and the flap so well done that I will allow you to go to the swamp with me tomorrow. Several nice storks go there with their children. Now just let me see that mine are the nicest. Don't forget to carry your heads high. It looks well and gives you an air of importance. But are we not to have a revenge on the naughty boys? asked the young storks. Let them scream as much as they like. You will fly away with the clouds to the land of the pyramids, while they will perhaps be freezing. There won't be a green leaf or a sweet apple here then. But we will have our revenge, they whispered to each other, and then they began their drilling again. Of all the boys in the street, not one was worse at making fun of the storks than he who first began the derisive song. He was a tiny little fellow, not more than six years old. It is true the young storks thought he was at least a hundred, for he was so much bigger than their father and mother, and they had no idea how old children and grown-up people could be. They reserved all their vengeance for the boy who first began to tease them, and who never would leave off. The young storks were frightfully irritated by the teasing, and the older they grew, the less they would stand it. At last their mother was obliged to promise that they should have their revenge, but not till the last day before they left. We shall first have to see how you behave at the maneuvers. If you come to grief and the general has to run you through the breast with his beak, the boys will, after all, be right, at least in one way. Now let us see. That you shall, said the young ones, and didn't they take pains. They practiced every day till they could fly as lightly as any feather. It was quite a pleasure to watch them. Then came the autumn. All the storks began to assemble before they started on their flight to the warm countries where they spend their winters. Those were indeed maneuvers. They had to fly over woods and towns to try their wings, because they had such a long journey before them. The young storks did everything so well that they got no end of frogs and snakes as prizes. They had the best characters, and then they could eat the frogs and snakes afterwards, which you may be sure they did. Now we shall have our revenge, they said. Yes, certainly, said the mother stork. My plan is this, and I think it is the right one. I know the pond where all the little human babies lie, till the storks fetch them and give them to their parents. The pretty little creatures lie there asleep, dreaming sweet dreams, sweeter than any they ever dream afterwards. Every parent wishes for such a little baby, and every child wants a baby brother or sister. Now we fly to the pond and fetch a little brother or sister for each of those children who did not join in singing that horrid song, or in making fun of the storks. But those who sang it shall not have one. But what about that bad wicked boy who first began the song, shrieked the young storks. What is to be done to him? In the pond there is a little dead baby. It has dreamed itself to death. We will take it to him, and then he will cry, because we have brought him a little dead brother. But you have surely not forgotten the good boy who said it is a shame to make fun of the creatures. We will take both a brother and a sister to him, and because his name is Peter, you shall all be called Peter too. It happened just as she said, and all storks are called Peter to this day. End of section 20《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
Nobody had even given her a copper. The poor little creature was hungry and perishing with cold, and she looked the picture of misery. The snowflakes fell upon her long yellow hair, which curled so prettily around her face. But she paid no attention to that. Lights were shining from every window, and there was a most delicious odor of roast goose in the streets, for it was New Year's Eve. She could not forget that. She found a corner where one house projected a little beyond the next one, and here she crouched, drawing up her feet under her. But she was colder than ever. She did not dare go home, for she had not sold any matches, and had not earned a single penny. Her father would beat her. Besides, it was almost as cold at home as it was here. They only had the roof over them, and the wind whistled through it, although they stuffed up the biggest cracks with rags and straw. Her little hands were almost dead with cold. Oh, one little match would do some good. Dared she pull one out of the bundle and strike it on the wall to warm her fingers. She pulled one out. Rish! How it sputtered. How it blazed. It burnt with a bright, clear flame, just like a little candle when she held her hand around it. It was a very curious candle, too. The little girl fancied that she was sitting in front of a big brass stove with polished brass feet and handles. There was a splendid fire blazing in it and warming her so beautifully. But what happened? Just as she was stretching out her feet to warm them, the blaze went out, the stove vanished, and she was left sitting with the end of the burned-out match in her hand. She struck a new one. It burnt, it blazed up, and where the light fell upon the wall, it became transparent like gauze, and she could see right through it into the room. The table was spread with a snowy cloth and pretty china, a roast goose stuffed with apples and prunes was steaming on it, and what was even better, the goose hopped from the dish with the carving knife and fork sticking in its back, and it waddled across the floor. It came right up to the poor child, and then a the match went out, and there was nothing to be seen but the thick black wall. Again she lit another. This time she was sitting under a lovely Christmas tree. It was much bigger and more beautifully decorated than the one she had seen when she peeped through the glass doors at the rich merchant's house this very last Christmas. Thousands of lighted candles gleamed upon its branches, such as she had seen in the shop windows looked down to her. The little girl stretched out both her hands towards them, then out went the match. All the Christmas candles rose higher and higher, till she saw that they were only the twinkling stars. One of them fell and made a bright streak of light across the sky. Someone is dying, thought the little girl, for her old grandmother. The only person who had ever been kind to her used to say, When a star falls, a soul is going up to God. Now she struck another match against the wall, and this time it was her grandmother who appeared in the circle of the flame. She saw her quite clearly and distinctly, looking so gentle and happy. Grandmother, cried the little creature, oh, do take me with you. I know you will vanish when the match goes out. You will vanish like the warm stove, the delicious goose and the beautiful Christmas tree. She hastily struck a whole bundle of matches, because she did so long to keep her grandma with her. The light of the matches made it as bright as day. Grandmother had never before looked so big or so beautiful. She lifted the little girl up in her arms, and they soared in a halo of light and joy, far, far above the earth, where there was no more cold, no hunger, no pain, for they were with God. In the morning light, the poor little girl sat there, in the corner between the houses, with rosy cheeks and a smile on her face, dead, frozen to death on the last night of the old year. New Year's Day broke on the little body still sitting with the ends of the burnt-out matches in her hands. She must have tried to warm herself, they said. Nobody knew what beautiful visions she had seen, nor in what a halo she had entered with her grandmother upon the glories of the new year. End of section 21. Recording by Cal Taylor. Section 22 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Calvin Kloss Taylor. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Great Klaus and Little Klaus. In a village there once lived two men of the self-same name. 
they were both called Klaus, but one of them had four horses and the other had only one. So to distinguish them, people called the owner of the four horses Great Klaus, and he who had only one Little Klaus. Now I should tell you what happened to them, for this is a true story. Throughout the week, Little Klaus was obligated to plow for Great Klaus and to lend him his one horse. But once a week, on Sunday, Great Klaus lent him all his four horses. Hurrah! How Little Klaus would smack his whip over all five, for they were as good as his own on that one day. The sun shone brightly, and the church bells rang merrily as the people passed by dressed in their best with their prayer books under their arms they were going to hear the parson preach they looked at little klaus plowing with his five horses and he was so proud that he smacked his whip and said get up my five horses you mustn't say that said great klaus for only one of them is yours but little klaus soon forgot what he ought not to say and when anyone passed he would call out giddy up my five horses i must really beg you not to say that again said great klaus for if you do i shall hit your horse on the head so that he will drop down dead on the spot and there will be an end of him i promise you i will not say it again said the other but as soon as any one came by nodding to him and wishing him good day he was so pleased and thought how grand it was to have five horses plowing in his field that he cried out again, Giddy up, all my horses. Oh, giddy up your horses for you, said Great Klaus, and seizing the tethering mallet, he struck Little Klaus's one horse on the head, and it fell down dead. Oh, now I have no horse at all, said Little Klaus, weeping, but after a while he flayed the dead horse and hung up the skin in the wind to dry. Then he put the dried skin in a bag, and hanging it over his shoulder, went off to the next town to sell it. But he had a long way to go and had to pass through a dark and gloomy forest presently a storm arose and he lost his way and before he discovered the right path the evening was drawing on and it was still a long way to the town and too far to return home before nightfall near the road stood a large farmhouse the shutters outside the windows were closed but lights shone through the crevices and at the top they might let me stay here for the night thought little klaus so he went up to the door and knocked the farmer's wife opened the door, but when she heard what he wanted, she told him to go away. Her husband was not at home, and she could not let any strangers in. Then I shall have to lie out here, said Little Klaus to himself as the farmer's wife shut the door in his face. Close to the farmhouse stood a large haystack, and between it and the house there was a small shed with a thatched roof. I can he up here, said Little Klaus, as he saw the roof. It will make a famous bed but I hope the stork won't fly down and bite my legs. A live stork was standing up there who had his nest on the roof. So little Klaus climbed on to the roof of the shed, and as he turned about to make himself more comfortable, he discovered that the wooden shutters did not reach to the top of the windows so that he could see into the room, in which he saw a large table was laid out with wine, roast meat, and a splendid fish. The farmer's wife and the sexton were sitting at table together. Nobody else was there. She was filling his glass and helping him plentifully to the fish, which appeared to be his favorite dish. If only I could have some too, thought little Klaus. And then, as he stretched out his neck towards the window, he spied a beautiful large cake. Indeed, they had a glorious feast before them. At that moment, he heard someone riding down the road towards a farm. It was a farmer coming home. He was a good man, but he had one very strange prejudice. He could not bear the sight of a sexton. If he happened to see one, he would get into a terrible rage. In consequence of this dislike, the sexton had gone to visit the farmer's wife during her husband's absence from home, and the good woman had put before him the best of everything she had in a house to eat. When they heard the farmer, they were dreadfully frightened, and a woman made the sexton creep into the large chest which stood in the corner. He went at once, for he was well aware of the poor man's aversion to the sight of a sexton. The woman then quickly hid all the nice things and the wine in the oven, because if her husband had seen it, he would have asked why it was provided. Oh, dear, sighed little Klaus on the roof when he saw the food disappearing. 
Is there anyone up there? asked the farmer, peering up at Little Claus. What are you doing up there? You had better come into the house. Then Little Claus told him how he had lost his way and asked if he might have some shelter for the night. Certainly, said the farmer, but the first thing is to have something to eat. The woman received them both very kindly, laid the table, and gave them a large bowl of porridge. The farmer was hungry and ate it with a good appetite, but Little Klaus could not help thinking of the good roast meat, the fish, and the cake, which he knew were hidden in the oven. He had put his sack with the hide in it under the table by his feet, for, as we remember, he was on his way to the town to sell it. He did not fancy the porridge, so he trod on a sack and made the dried hide squeak quite loudly. Hush, said Little Klaus to his sack, at the same time treading on it again, so that it squeaked louder than ever. What on earth have you got in your sack? asked the farmer again. Oh, it's a goblin, said Little Klaus. He says we needn't eat the porridge, for he has charmed the oven full of roast meat and fish and cake. What do you say? said the farmer, opening the oven door with all speed, and seeing the nice things the woman had in but which her husband thought the goblin had produced for their special benefit. The woman dared not say anything, but put the food before them, and then they both made a hearty meal of the fish, the meat, and the cake. Then little Klaus trod on the skin and made it squeak again. What does he say now? asked the farmer. He says, answered little Klaus, that he has also charmed three bottles of wine in the oven for us. So the woman had to bring out the wine, too, and the farmer drank it and became very merry. Wouldn't he like to have a goblin, like the one in Little Klaus's sack for himself? Can he charm out the devil? asked the farmer. I shouldn't mind seeing him, now that I am in such a merry mood. Oh, yes, said Little Klaus. My goblin can do everything that we ask him. Can't you? he asked, trampling on the sack till it squeaked louder than ever. Do you hear what I say? But the devil is so ugly. You'd better not see him. Oh, I'm not a bit frightened. Whatever does he look like? Well, he will have to show himself in the image of a sexton. Oh, dear, said the farmer. That's bad. I must tell you that I can't bear to see a sexton. However, it doesn't matter. I shall know it's only the devil, and then I shan't mind so much. Now my courage is up, but he mustn't come too close. I'll ask my goblin about it, said little Klaus, treading on the bag and putting his ear close to it. What does he say? He says you can go along and open the chest in the corner, and there you'll see the devil moping in the dark. But hold the lid tight so that he doesn't get out. Will you help me to hold it? asked the farmer, going along to the chest where the woman had hidden the real sexton, who was shivering with fright. The farmer lifted up the lid a wee little bit and peeped in. Ha! ha! he shrieked and shrank back. Yes, I saw him, and he looked exactly like our sexton. It was a horrible sight. They had to have a drink after this, and there they sat, drinking till far into the night. You must sell me that goblin, said the farmer. You may ask what you like for him. I'll give you a bushel of money for him. No, I, I can't do that, said Little Klaus. You must remember how useful my goblin is to me. Oh, but I should so like to have him, said the farmer, and he went on begging for him. Well, said Little Klaus at last, as you have been so kind to me, I shall have to give him up. You shall have my goblin for a bushel of money, but I must have it full to the brim. You shall have it, said the farmer, but you must take that chest away with you. I won't have it in the house for another hour. You never know whether he's there or not. So Little Klaus gave his sack with the dried hide in it to the farmer, and received in return a bushel of money for it, and the measure was full to the brim. The farmer also gave him a large wheelbarrow to take the money in the chest away in. Goodbye, said Little Klaus, and off he went with his money and the big chest with the sexton in it. There was a wide and deep river on the other side of the wood. The stream was so strong that it was almost impossible to swim against it. A large new bridge had been built across it, and when they got into the very middle of it, Little Klaus said quite loud so that the sexton could hear him, what am I supposed to do with this stupid old chest? It might be full of paving stones. It's so heavy. I am quite tired of wheeling it along. I'll just throw it into the river. If it floats down the river to my house, well and good. And if it doesn't, I shan't care. 
Then he took hold of the chest and raised it up a bit, as if he was about to throw it into the river. No, no, let it be, shouted the sexton. Let me out. Let me get out. Hello, said little Klaus, pretending to be frightened. Why, he's still inside it. Then I must heave it into the river to drown him. Oh, no, oh, no, shouted the sexton. I'll give you a bushel full of money if you'll let me out. Oh, that's another matter, said little Klaus, opening the chest. The sexton crept out at once and pushed the empty chest into the water and then went home and gave little Klaus a whole bushel full of money. He had already had one from the farmer, you know, so now his wheelbarrow was quite full of money. I got a pretty fair price for that horse, I must admit, he said to himself when he got home to his own room and then turned the money out of the wheelbarrow into a heap on the floor. What a rage great Klaus will be in when he discovers how rich I have become through my one horse, but I won't tell him straight out about it. So he sent a boy to Great Klaus to borrow a bushel measure. What does he want that for, thought Great Klaus, and he rubbed some tallow on the bottom so that a little of whatever was to be measured might stick to it. So it did, for when the measure came back, three new silver threepenny bits were sticking to it. What's this? said Great Klaus, and he ran straight along to Little Klaus. Where on earth did you get all that money? Oh, that was for my horse's hide, which I sold last night. That was well paid indeed, said Great Klaus, and he ran home, took an axe, and hit all his four horses on the head. He then flayed them and went off to the town with the hides. Skins! Skins! Who will buy skins? he shouted up and down the streets. All the shoemakers and tanners in the town came running up and asked him how much he wanted for them. A bushel of money for each, said Great Klaus. Are you mad? they all said. Do you imagine we have money by the bushel? Skins, skins, who will buy skins, he shouted again. And the shoemakers took up their measures, and the tanners their leather aprons, and beat Great Klaus through the town. Skins, skins, they mocked him. Yes, we'll give you a raw hide. Out of the town with him, they shouted. And Great Klaus had to hurry off as fast as ever he could go. He never had such a beating in his life. Little Klaus shall pay for this, he said when he got home. I'll kill him for it. Little Klaus's old grandmother had just died in his house. She certainly had been very cross and unkind to him. But now she was dead. He felt quite sorry about it. He took the dead woman and put her into his warm bed to see if he could bring her to life again. He meant her to stay there all night, and he could sit on a chair in the corner. He had slept like that before. As he sat there in the night, the door opened, and in came Great Klaus with his axe. He knew where little Klaus's bed stood, and he went straight up to it and hit the dead grandmother a blow to the forehead, thinking that it was little Klaus. Just see if you'll cheat me again after that, he said, and then he went home again. What a bad, wicked man he is, said little Klaus. He was going to kill me there. What a good thing that poor whole granny was dead already or else he would have killed her. He now dressed his old grandmother in her best Sunday clothes, borrowed a horse of his neighbor, harnessed it to a cart, and set his grandmother on the back seat so that she could not fall out when the cart moved. Then he started off through the wood. When the sun rose, he was just outside a big inn, and little Klaus drew up his horse and went in to get something to eat. The landlord was a very, very rich man and a very good man, but he was fiery tempered as if he were made of pepper and tobacco good morning said he to little klaus you've got your best clothes on very early this morning yes said little klaus i'm going to town with my old grandmother she's sitting out there in the cart i can't get her to come in won't you take her out a glass of mead you'll have to shout at her she's very hard of hearing yes she shall have it said the innkeeper and he poured out a large glass of mead which he took out to the dead grandmother in the cart. Here is a glass of mead your son has sent, said the innkeeper. But the dead woman sat quite still and never said a word. Don't you hear, shouted the innkeeper as loud as ever he could. Here is a glass of mead from your son. Again he shouted, and then again as loud as ever. But as she did not stir, he got angry and threw the glass of mead in her face so that the mead ran all over her and she fell backwards out of the cart 
for she was only stuck up and not tied in. Now, shouted Little Klaus, as he rushed out of the inn and seized the landlord by the neck, you have killed my grandmother. Just look, there's a great hole in her forehead. Oh, what a misfortune, exclaimed the innkeeper, clasping his hands. That's a consequence of my fiery temper. Good little Klaus, I will give you a bushel of money and bury your grandmother as if she had been my own, if you will only say nothing about it or else they will chop my head off, and that is so nasty. So Little Klaus had a whole bushel of money, and the innkeeper buried the old grandmother just as if she was his own. When Little Klaus got home again with all his money, he immediately sent over his boy to Great Klaus to borrow his measure. What? said Great Klaus. Is he not dead? I shall have to go see about it myself. So he took the measure over to see Little Klaus himself, i say wherever did you get all that money asked he his eyes round with amazement at what he saw it was my grandmother you killed instead of me said little klaus i have sold her and got a bushel of money for her that was good pay indeed said great klaus and he hurried home took an axe and killed his old grandmother he then put her in a cart and drove off to town with her where the apothecary lived and asked if anyone would buy a dead body. Who is it, and where did the body come from? asked the apothecary. It's my grandmother, and I have killed her for a bushel of money, said Great Klaus. Heaven preserve us, said the apothecary. You are talking like a madman. Pray don't say such things. You might lose your head. And he pointed out to him what a horribly wicked thing he had done, and what a bad man he was who deserved punishment. Great Klaus was so frightened that he rushed straight out of the shop, jumped into the cart, whipped up his horse, and galloped home. The apothecary and everyone else thought he was mad, and so they let him drive off. You shall be paid for this, said Great Klaus, when he got out on the high road. You shall pay for this, little Klaus. As soon as he got home, he took the biggest sack he could find, went over to the little Klaus, and said, you have deceived me again. First I killed my horses, and then my old grandmother. It's all your fault, but you shan't have a chance of cheating me again. Then he took little Klaus by the waist and put him into the sack, and put it on his back and shouted to him, I'm going to drown you now. It was a long way to go before he came to the river, and little Klaus was not so light to carry. The road passed close by the church in which the organ was playing, and the people were singing beautifully. Great Klaus put down the sack with Little Klaus in it close by the church door and thought he would like to go and hear a psalm before he went any further. Little Klaus could not get out of the bag, and all the people were in the church, so he went in too. Oh dear, oh dear, sighed Little Klaus in the sack. He turned and twisted, but it was impossible to undo the cord. Just then an old cattle drover with white hair and a tall stick in his hand came along. He had a whole drove of cows and bulls before him. They ran against the sack Little Klaus was in and upset it. Oh dear, sighed Little Klaus, I am so young to be going to the kingdom of heaven. And I, said the cattle drover, and so old and can I get there yet. Open the sack, shouted Little Klaus. Get in in place of me and you will get to heaven directly. Well, that will suit me, said the cattle drover, undoing the sack for Little Klaus, who immediately sprang out. You must look after the cattle now, said the old man as he crept into the sack. Little Klaus tied it up and walked off driving the cattle before him. A little while after Great Klaus came out of the church, he took up the sack again on his back and certainly thought it had grown lighter, for the old cattle drover was not more than half the weight of Little Klaus. How light he seems to have got. That must be because I have been to church and said my prayers. Then he went to the river, which was both wide and deep, and threw the sack with the old cattle drover in it into the water, shouting as he did so, for he thought it was little Klaus. Now you won't cheat me again. Then he went homewards, but when he reached the crossroads, he met little Klaus with his herd of cattle. What's the meaning of this? exclaimed great Klaus. Didn't I drown you? Yes, said little Klaus. It's just about half an hour since you threw me into the river. But where did you get all those splendid beasts? asked Great Klaus. 
" They are sea cattle," said Little Claus. " I will tell you the whole story, and indeed I thank you heartily for drowning me. I am at the top of the tree now and a very rich man, I can tell you. I was so frightened when I was in the sack, the wind whistled in my ears, and when you threw me over the bridge into the cold water, I immediately sank to the bottom. But I was not hurt, for the grass is beautifully soft down there." The sack was opened at once by a beautiful maiden in snow-white clothes with a green wreath on her wet hair. She took my hand and said, Are you there, little Klaus? Here are some cattle for you, and a mile further up the road you will come upon another herd which I will give you too. Then I saw that the river was a great highway for the sea folk. Down at the bottom of it they walked and drove about from the sea right up to the end of the river. The flowers were lovely and the grass was so fresh the fishes which swam about glided close to me as just like birds in the air how nice the people were and what a lot of cattle strolling about in the ditches but why did you come straight up here again then asked great claus i shouldn't have done that if it was so fine down there oh said little claus that's just my cunning you remember i told you that the mermaid said that a mile further up the road and by the road she means river, for she can't go anywhere else, I should find another herd of cattle waiting for me. Well, I know how many bends there are in a river, and what a roundabout way it would be. It's ever so much shorter if you can come up on dry land and take the shortcuts. You save a couple of miles by it and get the cattle much sooner. Oh, you are a fortunate man, said Great Klaus. Do you think I should get some sea cattle if I were to drown at the bottom of the river? i'm sure you would said little claus but i can't carry you in a sack to the river you're too heavy for me if you like to walk there and then get in the sack i'll throw you into the river with the greatest pleasure in the world thank you said great claus but if i don't get any sea cattle when i get down there see if i don't give you a sound threshing oh don't be so hard on me they then walked off to the river as soon as the cattle saw the water they rushed down to drink for they were very thirsty. See what a hurry they're in, said Little Klaus. They want to get down to the bottom again. Now help me first, said Great Klaus, or else I'll thrash you. He then crept into the big sack, which had been lying across the back of one of the cows. Put a big stone in it, or I'm afraid I shan't sink, said Great Klaus. Oh, that'll be all right, said Little Klaus. But he put a big stone into the sack and gave it a push. Plump went to sack, and Great Klaus was in the river, where he sank to the bottom at once. I'm afraid he won't find any cattle, said Little Klaus as he drove his herd home. End of section 22please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Garden of Paradise There was once a king's son. Nobody had so many or such beautiful books as he had. He could read about everything which had ever happened in this world and see it all represented in the most beautiful pictures. He could get information about every nation and every country, but as to where the Garden of Paradise was to be found, not a word could he discover, and this was the very thing he thought most about. His grandmother had told him when he was quite a little fellow and was about to begin his school life, that every flower in the Garden of Paradise was a delicious cake and that the pistols were full of wine in one flower history was written in another geography or tables you had only to eat the cake and you knew the lesson the more you ate the more history geography and tables you knew all this he believed then but as he grew older and wiser and learnt more he easily perceived that the delights of the garden of paradise must be far beyond all this oh why did eve take of the tree of knowledge why did adam eat the forbidden fruit if it had only been I, it would not have happened. Never would sin have entered the world. This is what he said then, 
and he still said it when he was seventeen his thoughts were full of the garden of paradise he walked into the wood one day he was alone for that was his greatest pleasure evening came on the clouds drew up and it rained as if the whole heaven had become a sluice from which the water poured in sheets it was as dark as it was otherwise in the deepest well now he slipped on the wet grass and then he fell on the bare stones which jutted out of the rocky ground everything was dripping and at last the poor prince hadn't got a dry thread on him he had to climb over huge rocks where the water oozed out of the thick moss he was almost fainting just then he heard a curious murmuring and saw in front of him a big lighted cave a fire was burning in the middle big enough to roast a stag which was in fact being done a splendid stag with its huge antlers was stuck on a spit being slowly turned around between the hewn trunks of two fir trees an oldish woman tall and strong enough to be a man dressed up sat by the fire throwing on logs from time to time come in by all means she said sit down by the fire so that your clothes may dry there is a shocking draught here said the prince as he sat down on the ground it will be worse than this when my sons come home said the woman you are in the cavern of the winds my sons are the four winds of the world do you understand who are your sons asked the prince well that's not so easy to answer when the question is stupidly put said the woman my sons do as they like they are playing rounders now with the clouds up there in the great hall and she pointed up into the sky oh indeed said the prince you seem to speak very harshly and you are not so gentle as the woman i generally see about me oh i dare say they have nothing else to do i have to be harsh if i am to keep my boys under control but i can do it although they are a stiff-necked lot do you see those four sacks hanging on the wall they are just as frightened of them as you used to be of the cane behind the looking-glass i can double the boys up i can tell you and then they have to go into the bag we don't stand upon ceremony and there they have to stay they can't get out to play their tricks till it suits me to let them but here we have one of them it was the north wind who came in with an icy blast great hailstones peppered about the floor and snowflakes drifted in he was dressed in bearskin trousers and jacket and he had a sealskin cap drawn over his ears long icicles were hanging from his beard and one hailstone after another dropped down from the collar of his jacket don't go straight to the fire said the prince you might easily get chilblains chilblains said the north wind with a loud laugh chilblains they are my greatest delight what sort of a feeble creature are you how did you get into the cave of the winds he is my guest said the old woman and if you are not pleased with that explanation you may go into the bag now you know my opinion this had its effect and the north wind told them where he came from and where he had been for the last month i came from the arctic seas he said i have been on bering island with the russian walrus hunters i sat at the helm and slept when they sailed from the north cape and when i woke now and then the stormy petrels were flying about my legs they are queer birds they give a brisk flap with their wings and then keep them stretched out and motionless even when they don't have enough speed pray don't be too long-winded said the mother of the winds so at last you got to bering island it's perfectly splendid there you have a floor to dance upon as flat as a pancake half thawed snow with moss there were bones of whales and polar bears lying about they looked like the legs and arms of giants covered with green mold one would think that the sun had never shone on them i gave a little puff to the fog so that one could see the shed it was a house built of wreckage and covered with the skins of whales the flesh side was turned outwards it was all red and green a living polar bear sat on the roof growling i went to the shore and looked at the birds' nests looked at the unfledged young ones screaming and gaping then i blew down thousands of their throats and they learnt to shut their mouths lower down the walruses were rolling about like monster maggots with pigs heads and teeth a yard long you're a good storyteller my boy said his mother it makes my mouth water to hear you then there was a hunt the harpoons were plunged into the walrus's breasts and the steaming blood spurted out of them like fountains over the ice 
then i remembered my part of the game i blew up and made my ships the mountain high icebergs nipped the boats whew how they whistled and how they screamed but i whistled louder they were obliged to throw the dead walruses chests and ropes out upon the ice i shook the snowflakes over them and let them drift southwards to taste the salt water they will never come back to bering island then you've been doing evil said the mother of the winds what good i did the others may tell you said he but here we have my brother from the west i like him best of all he smells of the sea and brings a splendid cool breeze with him is that little zephyr asked the prince yes certainly it is zephyr but he is not so little as all that he used to be a pretty boy once but that's gone by he looked like a wild man of the woods but he had a padded hat on so as to not come to any harm he carried a mahogany club cut in the american mahogany forest it could not be anything less than that where did you come from asked his mother from the forest wilderness he said where the thorny creepers make a fence between every tree where the water snake lies in the wet grass and where human beings seem to be superfluous what did you do there i looked at the mighty river saw where it dashed over the rocks in dust and flew with the clouds to carry the rainbow i saw the wild buffalo swimming in the river but the stream carried him away he floated with the wild duck which soared into the sky at the rapids but the buffalo was carried over the water i liked that and blew a storm so that the primeval trees had to sail too and they were whirled along like shavings and have you done nothing else asked the old woman i have been doing somersaults in the savannas patting the wild horse and shaking down coconuts oh yes i have plenty of stories to tell but one need not tell everything you know that very well old woman and then he kissed his mother so heartily that she nearly fell backwards he was indeed a wild boy the south wind appeared now in a turban and a flowing bedouin's cloak it is fearfully cold in here he said throwing wood on the fire it is easy to see that the north wind got here first it is hot enough to roast a polar bear said the north wind you are a polar bear yourself said the south wind do you want to go into the bag asked the old woman sit down on that stone and tell us where you have been in africa mother he answered i've been chasing the line with the hottentots in kafirland what grass there is on those plains as green as an olive the gnu was dancing about and the ostriches ran races with me but i am still the fastest i went to the desert with its yellow sand it looks like the bottom of the sea i met a caravan they were killing their last camel to get water to drink but it wasn't much they got the sun was blazing above and the sand burning below there were no limits to the outstretched desert then i burrowed into the fine loose sand and whirled it up in great columns that was a dance you should have seen how despondently the dromedary stood and the merchant drew his captain over his head he threw himself down before me as if i had been allah his god now they are buried and there is a pyramid of sand over them all when i blow it away sometime the sun will bleach their bones and then travellers will see that people have been there before otherwise you would hardly believe it in the desert then you have only been doing harm said the mother into the bag you go and before he knew where he was she had the south wind by the waist and in the bag it rolled about on the ground but she sat upon it and then it had to be quiet your sons are lively fellows said the prince yes indeed she said but i can master them here comes the fourth it was the east wind and he was dressed like a chinaman oh have you come from that quarter said the mother i thought you had been in the garden of paradise i am only going there to-morrow said the east wind it will be a hundred years to-morrow since i have been there i have just come from china where i danced round the porcelain tower till all the bells jingled the officials were flogged in the streets the bamboo canes were broken over their shoulders and they were all people ranging from the first to the ninth rank they shrieked many thanks father and benefactor but they didn't mean what they said and i went on ringing the bells and singing sing sing so you're quite uproarious about it said the old woman it's a good thing you're going to the garden of paradise to-morrow it always has a good effect on your behavior mind you drink deep at the well of wisdom and bring a little bottle full home for me that i will said the east wind but why have you put my brother from the south into the bag out with him 
he must tell me about the phoenix the princess always wants to hear about that bird when i call every hundred years open the bag then you'll be my sweetest mother and i'll give you two pockets full of tea as green and fresh as when i picked it well for the sake of the tea and because you are my darling i will open the bag she did open it and the south wind crept out but he was quite crestfallen because the strange prince had seen his disgrace here is a palm leaf for the princess said the south wind the old phoenix the only one in the world gave it to me he has scratched his whole history on it with his bill for the hundred years of his life and she can read it for herself i saw how the phoenix set fire to his nest himself and sat on it while it burnt like the widow of a hindu oh how the dry branches crackled how it smoked and what a smell there was at last it all burst into flame the old bird was burnt to ashes but his egg lay glowing in the fire it broke with a loud bang and the young one flew out now it rules over all the birds and it is the only phoenix in the world he bit a hole in the leaf i gave you that is his greeting to the princess let us have something to eat now said the mother of the winds and they all sat down to eat the roast stag and the prince sat by the side of the east wind so they soon became good friends i say said the prince just tell me who is this princess and where is the garden of paradise oh ho said the east wind if that is where you want to go you must fly with me to-morrow but i may as well tell you that no human being has been there since adam and eve's time you know all about them i suppose from your bible stories of course said the prince when they were driven away the garden of eden sank into the ground but it kept its warm sunshine its mild air and all its charms the queen of the fairies lives there the island of bliss where death never enters and where living as a delight is there get on my back to-morrow and i will take you with me i think i can manage it but you mustn't talk now i want to go to sleep when the prince woke up in the early morning he was not a little surprised to find that he was already high above the clouds he was sitting on the back of the east wind who was holding him carefully they were so high up that woods and fields rivers and lakes looked like a large colored map good morning said the east wind you may as well sleep a little longer for there is not much to be seen in this flat country below us unless you want to count the churches they look like chalk dots on the green board he called the fields and meadows the green board it was very rude of me to leave without saying good-bye to your mother and brothers said the prince one is excused when one is asleep said the east wind and they flew on faster than ever you could mark their flight by the rustling of the trees as they passed over the woods and whenever they crossed a lake or the sea the waves rose and the great ships dipped low down in the water like floating swans towards evening the large towns were amusing as it grew dark with all their lights twinkling now here now there just as when one burns a piece of paper and sees all the little sparks like children coming home from school the prince clapped his hands but the east wind told him he had better leave off and hold tight or he might fall and find himself hanging on to a church steeple the eagle in the great forest flew swiftly but the east wind flew more swiftly still the cossack on his little horse sped fast over the plains but the prince sped faster still now you can see the himalayas said the east wind they are the highest mountains in asia we shall soon reach the garden of paradise they took a more southerly direction and the air became scented with spices and flowers figs and pomegranates grew wild and the wild vines were covered with blue and green grapes they both descended here and stretched themselves on the soft grass where the flowers nodded to the wind as much as to say welcome back are we in the garden of paradise now asked the prince no certainly not answered the east wind but we shall soon be there do you see that wall of rock and the great cavern where the wild vine hangs like a big curtain we have to go through there wrap yourself up in your cloak the sun is burning here but a step further on it is icy cold the bird which flies past the cavern has one wing out here in the heat of summer and the other is there in the cold of winter so that is the way to the garden of paradise said the prince now they entered the cavern oh how icily cold it was but it did not last long the east wind spread his wings and they shone like the brightest flame but what a cave it was 
large blocks of stone from which the water dripped hung over them in the most extraordinary shapes at one moment it was so low and narrow that they had to crawl on hands and knees the next it was as wide and lofty as if they were in the open air it looked like a chapel of the dead with mute organs pipes and petrified banners we seem to be journeying along death's road to the garden of paradise said the prince but the east wind never answered a word he only pointed before them where a beautiful blue light was shining the blocks of stone above them grew dimmer and dimmer and at last they became as transparent as a white cloud in the moonshine the air was also deliciously soft as fresh as on the mountain tops and as scented as down among the roses in the valley a river ran there as clear as the air itself and the fish in it were like gold and silver purple eels which gave out blue sparks with every curve gambled about in the water and the broad leaves of the water lilies were tinged with the hues of the rainbow while the flower itself was like a fiery orange flame nourished by the water just as oil keeps a lamp constantly burning a firm bridge of marble as delicately and skilfully carved as if it were lace and glass beads led over the water to the island of bliss where the garden of paradise bloomed the east wind took the prince in his arms and bore him over the flowers and leaves there sang all the beautiful old songs of his childhood but sang them more wonderfully than any human voice could sing them were these palm trees or giant water plants growing here the prince had never seen such rich and mighty trees the most wonderful climbing plants hung in wreaths such as only to be found in gold and colors on the margins of old books of the saints or entwined among their initial letters it was the most extraordinary combination of birds flowers and scrolls close by on the grass stood a flock of peacocks with their brilliant tails outspread yes indeed it seemed so but when the prince touched them he saw that they were not birds but plants they were big dock leaves which shone like peacocks tails lions and tigers sprang like agile cats among the green hedges which were scented with the blossom of the olive and the lion and the tiger were tame the wild dove glistening like a pearl beat the lion's mane with his wings and the antelope otherwise so shy stood by nodding just as if he wanted to join the game the fairy of the garden now advanced to meet them her garment shone like the sun and her face beamed like that of a happy mother rejoicing over her child she was young and very beautiful and was surrounded by a band of lovely girls each with a gleaming star in her hair when the east wind gave her the inscribed leaf from the phoenix her eyes sparkled with delight she took the prince's hand and led him into her palace where the walls were the color of the brightest tulips in the sunlight the ceiling was one great shining flower and the longer one gazed into it the deeper the calyx seemed the prince went to the window and looking through one of the panes saw the tree of knowledge with the serpent and adam and eve standing by are they not driven out he asked and the fairy smiled and explained that time had burned a picture into each pane but not of the kind one usually sees they were alive the leaves moved and people came and went like the reflections in a mirror then he looked through another pane and he saw jacob's dream with the ladder going straight up into heaven and angels with great wings were fluttering up and down all that had ever happened in this world lived and moved on these window panes only time could imprint such wonderful pictures the fairy smiled and led him into a large lofty room the walls of which were like transparent paintings of faces one more beautiful than the other these were millions of the blessed who smiled and sang and all their songs melted into one perfect melody the highest ones were so tiny that they seemed smaller than the very smallest rosebud no bigger than a pinpoint in a drawing in the middle of the room stood a large tree with handsome drooping branches the golden apples hung like oranges among its green leaves it was the tree of knowledge of whose fruit adam and eve had eaten from every leaf hung a shining red drop of dew it was as if the tree wept tears of blood now let us get into the boat said the fairy we shall find refreshment on the swelling waters the boat rocks but it does not move from the spot all the countries of the world will pass before our eyes it was a curious sight to see the whole coast move here came lofty snow-clad alps 
with their clouds and dark fir trees the horn echoed sadly among them and the shepherd yodeled sweetly in the valleys then banyan trees bent their long drooping branches over the boat black swans floated on the water and the strangest animals and flowers appeared on the shore this was new holland the fifth portion of the world which glided past them with a view of its blue mountains they heard the song of priests and saw the dances of the savages to the sound of drums and pipes of bone the pyramids of egypt reaching to the clouds with fallen columns and sphinxes half buried in sand next sailed past them then came the aurora borealis blazing over the peaks of the north they were fireworks which could not be imitated the prince was so happy and he saw a hundred times more than we have described can i stay here always he asked that depends on yourself answered the fairy if you do not like adam allow yourself to be tempted to do what is forbidden you can stay here always i will not touch the apples on the tree of knowledge said the prince there are thousands of other fruits here as beautiful test yourself and if you are not strong enough go back with the east wind who brought you he is going away now and will not come back for a hundred years the time will fly in this place like a hundred hours but that is a long time for temptation and sin every evening when i leave you i must say come with me and i must beckon to you but stay behind do not come with me for with every step you take your longing will grow stronger you will reach the hall where grows the tree of knowledge i sleep beneath its fragrant drooping branches you will bend over me and i must smile but if you press a kiss upon my lips paradise will sink deeper down into the earth and it will be lost to you the sharp winds of the wilderness will whistle round you the cold rain will draw from your hair sorrow and labor will be your lot i will remain here said the prince and the east wind kissed him on the mouth and said be strong then we shall meet again in a hundred years farewell farewell and the east wind spread his great wings they shone like poppies at the harvest time or the northern lights in a cold winter good-bye good-bye whispered the flowers storks and pelicans flew in a line like waving ribbons conducting him to the boundaries of the garden now we begin our dancing said the fairy at the end when i dance with you as the sun goes down you will see me beckon to you and cry come with me but do not come i have to repeat it every night for a hundred years every time you resist you will grow stronger and at last you will not even think of following to-night is the first time remember my warning and the fairy led him into a large hall of white transparent lilies the yellow stamens in each formed a little golden harp which echoed the sound of strings and flutes lovely girls slender and lissom dressed in floating gauze which revealed their exquisite limbs glided in dance and sang of the joy of living that they would never die and that the garden of paradise would bloom forever the sun went down and the sky was bathed in golden light which gave the lilies the effect of roses and the prince drank of the foaming wine handed to him by the maidens he felt such joy as he had never known before he saw the background of the hall opening where the tree of knowledge stood in a radiancy which blinded him the song proceeding from it was soft and lovely like his mother's voice and she seemed to say my child my beloved child then the fairy beckoned to him and said so tenderly come with me that he rushed towards her forgetting his promise forgetting everything on the first evening that she smiled and beckoned to him the fragrance in the scented air grew stronger the harp sounded sweeter than ever and it seemed as if the millions of smiling heads in the hall where the tree grew nodded and sang one must know everything man is lord of the earth they were no longer tears of blood which fell from the tree it seemed to him that they were red shining stars come with me come with me spoke those trembling tones and at every step the prince's cheeks burnt hotter and hotter and his blood coursed more rapidly i must go he said it is no sin i must see her asleep nothing will be lost if i do not kiss her and that i will not do my will is strong the fairy dropped her shimmering garment drew back the branches and a moment after was hidden within their depths i have not sinned yet said the prince nor will i then he drew back the branches there she lay asleep already beautiful as only the fairy of the garden of paradise can be 
she smiled in her dreams he bent over her and saw the tears welling up under her eyelashes do you weep for me he whispered weep not beautiful maiden i only now understand the full bliss of paradise it surges through my blood and through my thoughts i feel the strength of the angels and of everlasting life in my mortal limbs if it were to be everlasting night to me a moment like this were worth it and he kissed away the tears from her eyes his mouth touched hers then came a sound like thunder louder and more awful than any he had ever heard before and everything around collapsed the beautiful fairy the flowery paradise sank deeper and deeper the prince saw it sink into the darkness of night it shone far off like a tiny twinkling star the chill of death crept over his limbs he closed his eyes and lay long as if dead the cold rain fell on his face and the sharp wind blew around his head and at last his memory came back what have i done he sighed i have sinned like adam sinned so heavily that paradise has sunk low beneath the earth and he opened his eyes he could still see the star the faraway star which twinkled like paradise it was the morning star in the sky he got up and found himself in the wood near the cave of the winds and the mother of the winds sat by his side she looked angry and raised her hand so soon as the first evening she said i thought as much if you were my boy you should go into the bag ah he shall soon go there said death he was a strong old man with a scythe in his hand and great black wings he shall be laid in a coffin but not now i only mark him and then leave him for a time to wander about on the earth to expiate his sin and to grow better i will come some time soon when he least expects me i shall come back lay him in a black coffin put it on my head and fly to the skies the garden of paradise blooms there too and if he is good and holy he shall enter into it but if his thoughts are wicked and his heart still full of sin he will sink deeper in his coffin than paradise sank and i shall only go once in every thousand years to see if he is to sink deeper or to rise to the stars the twinkling stars up there end of section number 23section twenty four of fairy tales from hans christian andersen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org fairy tales from hans christian andersen translated by mrs edgar lucas little took now there was little Took. As a matter of fact, his name was not Took at all, but before he could speak properly, he called himself Took. He meant it for Carl, so it was just as well we should know that. He had to look after his sister Gustave, who was much smaller than he was, and then he had lessons to do, but these two things were rather difficult to manage at the same time. The poor boy sat with his little sister on his lap, and sang all the songs he knew, at the same time glancing at his geography book, which was open in front of him. Before the next morning he had to know all the towns in the island of Zealand by heart, and everything there was to know about them. At last his mother came home, for she had been out, and then she took little Gustave, took round to the window, and read as hard as ever he could, for it was getting dark, and mother could not afford to buy candles. "'There's the old washerwoman from the lane,' said his mother, as she looked out of the window. "'She can hardly carry herself, and yet she has to carry the pail from the pump. "'Run down, little Took, and be a dear boy. Help the old woman.' Took jumped up at once and ran to help her. But when he got home again, it was quite dark, and it was useless to talk about candles. He had to go to bed. He had an old turn-up bed and he lay in it thinking about his geography lesson, the island of Zealand, and all that the teacher had told him. He ought to have been learning the lesson, but of course he could not do that now. He put the geography book under his pillow, because he had heard that this would help him considerably to remember his lesson, but that can't be depended upon. 
He lay there thinking and thinking, and then all at once it seemed just as if someone kissed him on his eyes and his mouth, and he fell asleep. Yet he was not quite asleep either. It seemed to him as if the old washerwoman was looking at him with her kind eyes and saying, it would be a great shame if you were not to know your lessons. You helped me, and now I will help you, and our Lord will always help you. And all at once the book under his head went, Cribble, crabble. Cluck, 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 and there stood a hen from the town of Kyog. I am a Kyog hen. And then it told him how many inhabitants there were, and about the battle which had taken place there, which after all was not a very important one. Cribble, crabble, bang! Something plumped down. It was a wooden bird which now made its appearance. The popinjay from the shooting association impressed Du. It told him that there were just as many inhabitants as it had nails in its body, and it was very proud of this. Torvaldsen used to live close by my corner. The situation is beautiful. The little Took no longer lay in bed. He was on horseback. Gallop a gallop, he went. He was sitting in front of a splendidly dressed knight with a shining helmet and a waving plumage. They rode through the woods to the old town of Warningborg, and this was a big populous town. The castle towered over the royal city, and the light shone through the window. There was dancing and singing within, and King Waldemar led out the stately young court ladies to the dance. Morning came, and as the sun rose the town sank away, and the king's palace one tower after the other. At last only one tower remained on the hill where the castle had stood, and the town had become tiny and very poor. The schoolboys came along with their books under their arms, and they said, Two thousand inhabitants! But that was not true. There were not so many. Little Took was still lying in his bed. First he thought he was dreaming, and then he thought he was not dreaming. But there was somebody close to him, a sailor, a tiny little fellow, who might have been a cadet, but he was not a cadet, was saying to him, Little Took, Little Took, I am to greet you warmly from Corsa, which is a rising town. It is a flourishing town which has steamers and coaches. At one time it used to be called a tiresome town, but that was an old-fashioned opinion. I lie close to the sea, says Corsa. I have good high roads and pleasure gardens. I have given birth to a poet who is amusing, and that is more than they all are. I wanted to send a ship round the world. I did not do it, but I might have done it. Then there is the most delicious scent about me, because there are beautiful rose gardens close by the gates. Little Took saw them, the green and red flowering branches passed before his eyes, and then they vanished and changed into wooded heights, sloping to the clear waters of the field. A stately old church towered over the field with its twin spires. Springs of water flowed from the cliff and rushed down in rapid bubbling streams. Close by them sat an old king with a golden crown round his flowing locks. This was King Roar of the Springs and Ruskiel. Roar Springs is now the name of the town. Down over the slopes and past the springs walked hand in hand all Denmark's kings and queens wearing their crowns. On and on they went into the old church, to the pealing music of the organ and the rippling of the springs. Don't forget the estates of the realm, said King Roar. All at once everything vanished. Where were they? Now an old peasant woman stood before Took. She was a weeding woman, and came from Saw, where the grass grows on the market place. She had put her grey linen apron over her head and shoulders. It was soaking wet. There must have been rain. Yes, indeed, it has been raining, she said. She knew some of the comic parts of Holberg's plays, and she knew all about Valdemar and Absalom. Just as she was going to tell him these stories, she shrank up and wagged her head. It looked as if she was about to take a leap. Coax, she said. It is wet, it is wet, it is dull as ditch water in good old saw. She had become a frog. Coax. And then once more she was the old woman. One must dress according to the weather, said she. It is wet, it is wet. My town is like a bottle. You get in by the neck, and you have to come out the same way again. I used to have beautiful fish there once. Now I have rosy cheek boys down at the bottom of the bottle. They get a great deal of wisdom there. Greek, 
Greek, Hebrew, coax. It was just like the croaking of frogs or the creaking of fishing boots when you walk in a swamp. It was always the same sound, so tiresome, so tiresome that little Took fell into a deep sleep, which was the best thing for him. But even in this sound sleep he had a dream, or something of the sort. His little sister, Gustava, with the blue eyes and golden curly hair, had all at once become a lovely grown-up girl, and without having wings she could fly. They flew together right across Zealand over the green woods and deep blue waters. Do you hear the cock crowing, little Took? Cock-a-doodle-doo! Hens come flying from Kiel Town. You shall have such a big, big chicken yard. You will be a rich and happy man. Your house shall hold up its head like King Valdemar's towers, and it shall be richly built up with marble statues like those in Prastu. You understand me. I suppose your name will spread round the world with praise like the ship which was to have sailed from Corsa. It will be known in Roskiel town. Remember the estates of the realm, said King War. You shall speak well and wisely in Parliament, little Took, and when you are in your grave you shall sleep as quietly as... As if I were in sorrow, said little Took, and then he woke up. It was bright daylight, and he remembered... Nothing about his dream, but that was as it should be. One must not look into the future. He sprang out of bed and read his book till he knew his lesson, which he did almost at once. The old washerwoman put her head in at the door, nodded to him and said, Many thanks for your help yesterday, you dear child. May the Lord fulfil the dream of your heart. Little Took did not know a bit what he had dreamt. One above knew all about it. End of section 24. Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Recording by Pat Mathewson of England.